Well, I, I didn't have very far to come, as you know, to get here, but I appreciate uh, everyone else making <laughs> the effort in this miserable weather. So unlike Thailand this time of the year. <clears throat> um, today I thought I'd talk about um, a, a theme which um, sometimes seems to have a reference only to the highest realms of Buddhism um, and um, uh, maybe we sometimes uh, um, struggle a bit to find its relevance, its pertinence in, in daily life, especially lay life, but uh, nevertheless I thought I'd just explore these, uh, this, this uh, subject uh, today in, in that light. And that is the ten paramis, or paramis, uh, the, the perfections, the spiritual uh, virtues which are cultivated by a Buddha, by a Bodhisattva to become a Buddha. Um, the, um, the, the paramis uh, appear, uh, all of these terms appear in the sutta literature very often actually. Um, but they are not, uh, in the sutta literature, they are not organized and, and spoken of, taught as the, the ten paramis. But it's in the, and, and then in the uh, Jataka literature, the birth, birth stories of the Buddha, um, various births are spoken of in terms of particular of these paramis being developed by the Bodhisattva. Nevertheless, in later commentarial literature, I think maybe early on in the Vimutti Marga, the path of freedom, they are organized as this list of ten. And then uh, some of you who have familiarity with the Mahayana tradition, you'll be aware, uh, you'll have, have heard of the, the six paramitas, the, the um, six perfections, and often they are also um, extended to uh, ten in number for a different different purpose. And they are, they are somewhat different in, in, uh, in, uh, um, in quality. The terms are different. Anyway, there are ten of them, and um, I, I, I'm I, maybe it's just um, um, a kind of temperamental issue, or I'm I'm quite fond of sometimes just picking up a list in in Buddhism, and um, and just reflecting on it, um, just ruminating over it uh, for periods of time, sometimes. Uh, you know, for weeks or months or, or longer. Um, because oftentimes there's a kind of dynamic within, within the terms and as I reflect on which, on which, what each term means and, and how they're practiced, how they are matured and what they might look like in that maturation process. So I, I, I just find it interesting and um, I, I expect you've all got fridges and do people still use fridge magnets? Yes, okay. So um, it's always occurred to me that this is the sort of thing that would be really useful on, on people's fridges or wherever you put them near your computers or whatever. Just a list of, of healthy reflections. Uh, how am I doing? Uh, what can I do to you know, work on this particular spiritual faculty uh, this week or today or what have you? And at the end of the day, just kind of think over how many times you were able to refresh your um, your enthusiasm for, or your understanding of this uh, of this spiritual principle. So I I, I just offer I'll, I'll offer you uh, these uh, reflections in in that light. Um, the very first parami is is dana, generosity, giving, generous giving. And it's sometimes observed that even before a person is particularly has any spiritual aspirations or even before, even without, even in, in the absence of the presence of virtue, um, uh, still dana is possible. Um, uh, people perhaps of a fairly lowly character sometimes can be moved just to, to give something that they have because they see some someone or some being in distress, you know, just uh, 
giving a puppy some, some water when it's thirsty or something like that. But Dan, as we know, um, and uh, as I've <laughs> been the recipient of uh, these many years, and I'm very, I mean, I think all of the monastics who come to, to, um, to the BSV and the lay people as well are aware of the, the wonderful economy of, of, of Dan, uh, the feeling of, of, of generous giving. And um, for monastics, that sense of, of of receiving things which are purely offered and uh, with with just this heartfelt quality. Um, you don't need to be a monk or a nun to realize that actually receiving can be rather difficult. Sometimes people find it easier to give, but that that uh, th 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 there's something else going on when when we are um, when we're in a position to receive something. We think we're not, you know, we're not deserving of it, or we worry about how much it costs them, or, or there are various, uh, various uh, considerations that come into play. So Dana is a is a wonderful um, barmi to to reflect on, in the Buddha's life, um, or in the Bodhisattva's life. That is the the uh, historical Buddha before he b became fully awakened. Um, stories of his extraordinary um, uh, generosity are, um, are, are common, or at least are found in, in early texts. Sila, um, morality, virtue, second uh, barami. These, <clears throat> this is uh, the upholding of virtue. You've just taken the five precepts, and at the, at the very least, the five precepts we're told when they are when they are maintained with with some degree of regularity and and uh, intent and conscientiousness, will keep a person in the human realm in samsara. This is actually um, no small matter, considering the value of uh, a human rebirth. Um, human rebirth is particularly auspicious in that it it provides us an opportunity, a, a keen opportunity to work on uh, spiritual values and to, and to work on the Eightfold Path, for example. So this is a, a very, very important. But the gift of virtue, this is a, I mean, virtue, there is a, there is a dana element to, to sila as well. There's a, a generous element to, to keeping virtue, and that is that we are offering others um, a, the gift of harmlessness. People know that uh, people sense, uh, even not just people, but other beings, uh, animals, for example, sense that they're safe around us. Why? Because we, have, um, we, are, we are maintaining as our precept, among others, uh, not to kill, to harm other beings. Uh, people's... Um, People's property is safe in our care or in our presence because uh, we we are very careful, very scrupulous about uh, not not uh, stealing, not taking things which are not uh, uh, freely given, and so on. Um, this quality of virtue, uh, reflected on daily, uh, adds uh, considerable nobility to to a human life, and. Um, it, it increases the value of our friendships, the, 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 uh, the depth and, and meaning and value of our friendships and our presence with other people. And we, we become, I think, to some uh, small or large degree, a, a great gift to others and to each other in this, in this way. Obviously, I'm going through these fairly quickly because there are 10 of them, and I, I promised the <coughs> online audience and well done, online audience. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I promised them two questions, so trying to get through these. The third one is nekama, which is uh, um, relinquishment. Um, nekama. I think the Dalai Lama speaks of this in terms of simplicity. So relinquishment, simplicity, uh, renunciation is probably the most common translation for nekama. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, um, undertaking the, the bhikkhu, bhikkhuni life, this of course is, this is a, uh, an obvious expression of uh, renunciation. Um, again, though, I'm addressing lay people, and I think, I think it's very important that, that we all have, you all have an access to this um, through this issue of simplicity, for instance, that the Dalai Lama speaks of. I also think of it sometimes in terms of delayed gratification. 
you know, that, 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 that willingness, that ability to, to withhold from just getting what you want or doing what you want uh, t in this moment or today or, or even in the next few years in order to work on something else. Um, that kind of restraint, that, that discipline, is, we realize, necessary in, for any kind of accomplishment in life, whether it's uh, some exalted spiritual accomplishment or whether it's um, you know, getting your, your degree or um, raising a family. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was thinking this morning that um, the, the voluntary, the conscience, conscious um, um, decision um, to have a child, for instance, is a type of delayed gratification because you you realize that um, that um, there will be there will be many things over the next many years that will be unavailable to you in a material sense because you have to care for this child. Uh, your time is now under severe constraint often. Uh, maybe it's going to be sickly, and so there are periods where you have to give up your free time to to attend to it. Uh, the, uh, a good deal of your, your financial earnings are going to be required for its care, its education, its clothing and so forth. So undertaken in that kind of conscious sense, um, uh, there is a kind of relinquishment uh, or renunciation uh, here. That is a renunciation from purely expressing ourselves and getting what we can in the sensual realm. That in itself, of course, is another form of generosity. The, the fourth of the barmi is um, panya, or wisdom, discernment. Discernment is a nice kind of entree to, uh, to understand wisdom, I think. Uh, um, so you have a kind of careful reasoning, an observation, an examination of things, an analysis of things, and eventually, um, along with this, this uh, intellectual scrutiny and care through the practice of meditation, which is, which is supported by our moral bearing, the quality of our virtue, uh, wisdom also arises in its, in its more profound sense, which is um, a realization of, of things as they truly are, of our experience as it truly is. So wisdom uh, begins in, a, in fairly modest terms as discernment and care and, and scrutiny and examination and so forth, but it also involves in, in uh, the Buddhist tradition uh, deep insight into reality, which is both, um, well, which is transformative. Ultimately, it leads to uh, full awakening and the, the sloughing off of the enormous burdens of self and uh, of ignorance, and, uh, craving and, uh, and, and anger and so forth, which we tend to carry around one life after another. The, where are we, number, number five, I guess. The fifth uh, barami, parami is um, virya, energy, effort. Um, sometimes you, we ask ourselves, you know, when we feel, when the body is particularly lethargic or we just can't get the mind engaged and interested in something, what, what to do, what to do? And um, the, the, the answer to how it is to develop energy often comes in the form of making effort, just doing something, moving forward in some sort of wholesome way. The body is feeling really slow and you just don't feel like doing anything, you can't kind of engage and, and develop any enthusiasm for moving forward. So get up, put on your shoes, walk around the block, you know, breathe, come, get in your car, drive, drive across Melbourne and, and uh, arrive at the BSV on a Sunday morning. Uh, that kind of thing. This, this is productive, uh, conducive to developing uh, energy. So there is, there is something available. Energy is, uh, is, uh, is now available to apply. And of course, energy needs to be directed, applied in, in skillful ways. And that's why, we, that's why we speak with our friends about, about life. And that's why we read Buddhist literature. And that's why we come and meditate and so forth. Because all of these things are refining our orientation towards uh, this, this, this uh, process we call life. Uh, 
what is of value, what is, how is it that I pursue what is meaningful, uh, how is it that um, the things to which I aspire become, a pos become possible and realizable uh, uh, within this life. Uh, all of these things are made available because we have energy. We're 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 moving and we're moving in some kind of direction, and the 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 kamma, the um, <clears throat> the intentional activity that is that is directed in our in our life. Then, if we're using energy skillfully with discernment and wisdom, uh, see see number four. Uh, all of these things then are, are uh, working in our favor, in the favor of uh, our long-term goals, spiritual goals. Number, now I'm starting to lose track of numbers, but I think I'm still on, the, on, on target here. Number six, I think, is kanti, is patience. It's often, it's often said by our teachers, our great, uh, the great teachers in our tradition, that uh, patience is, the, uh, is, is really foremost in, in, uh, in life. Ajahn Chah would, would regularly tell uh, the monks that he was training that it's patience that really burns up the defilements. And of course, we have a, a very ancient um, uh, statement by the Buddha himself to that very, to that very uh, um, addressing that very theme. Patience, uh, it may begin with just holding ourselves back from saying something, doing something, and what have you, even thinking things which are, are unskillful or, or unkind and so forth. So there is a kind of patience. That's more like restraint, though. But uh, goodness knows we, we all need to be restrained, uh, from, restrained from time to time, especially if we have habits around uh, uh, that, that would normally look like the lack of restraint. If we have, have, have habits which are uh, born out of um, a kind of um, periods of anger, for instance, saying things which in re retrospect we, we, uh, we regret, which seem to have been unkind or at least untimely. Uh, also uh, habits around the, the immediate um, gratification of desires, you know. Buying that thing that just uh, strikes your fancy in the moment and then realizing, remembering again, that you really can't afford it. And it, it, this object really serves no particular <laughs> valuable purpose in, in, in your life. So patience uh, has, takes many, many forms. And, um, well, I don't have to tell parents that it's uh, very important uh, as, uh, in dealing with children, but but with one another too, and just as social beings. And then patience uh, in regards to uh, how it is we reflect on our own uh, behavior and habits and, and so forth. We do need to skillfully encourage and, and remind and, and restrain ourselves. And we, need, we, we also need to be kindly and patient towards things that we have, we have struggles with, with uh, living up to. Thinking of Ajahn Chah again, he uh, he once said, "This is this is uh, one of those things that that kind of sets you back in your chair a little bit." But he said, um, "Half of the half of the spiritual life is knowing what we need to do and being unable to do it." Doesn't mean you can never, you'll never be able to do it, but just that kind of honest, sober assessment of, of where you are, yeah, and having a kind of patience with that, and I think a kind of care and, and, and acceptance and, and maybe loving, loving uh, sense of where you are. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't preclude, of course, encouragement and, and you know, further effort and, and so forth. But it's just that we, we do need to be honest with ourselves uh, about where we are in, uh, at this time in our lives, at this time of the day or what have you. But I've, that's, it's one of the many uh, Ajahn Chah uh, observations which I've uh, carried around with me for, for some time. The, uh, where are we now? Is this number seven? We're at number seven. Truthfulness, satcha. Truthfulness. It's almost hard to know where to begin with this, isn't it? Um, 
we often as social beings um, find, give ourselves so many reasons for hedging a little bit or, you know, telling white lies or um, uh, uh, wishing basically to be agreeable, not to hurt feelings, not to give offense perhaps. Uh, that's one side of it. Uh, also, if somebody asks us a question about what we've been doing or who we are or where we are and so forth, sometimes we want to exaggerate a little bit, minimize maybe our fault, something we've just thought of, something we're not very, we're, we're not very proud of, or we want to kind of you know, buff up a little bit, um, put a little shine on, on some of the things that we sometimes do and make them sound a little grander than they, than they actually are. Um, there is, there is uh, this sense, this, this ongoing uh, process, this ongoing experience of self at the heart of all of this, somehow trying to protect uh, uh, ourselves from from injury, from 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 kind of honest assessment, various uh, various other uh, uh, injuries which uh, seem to affect this this uh, erroneous sense of self that we that we carry around with us, this great burden of, of self. But um, it's it's rare, and I've I've met a few people in my life who, on reflecting over their life, obviously they've at some time, and I would say in previous lives, made strong determinations around uh, truthfulness. And so one does occasionally meet a person in this life who can say, you know, and they can count on one finger, maybe, or one hand maybe, how many times they've actually lied in this, in this life. Now that, that is a real accomplishment. And I would hope that anyone who, who can, who can uh, say su such, uh, such a thing uh, truthfully would sometimes reflect on how rare that is and, and give themselves full, full credit for, for the quality of their virtue in regards to speech. Because that's a, 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 a fairly high standard, a very high standard. Most of us, however, um, we, you know, will we'll, um, we'll work this way and that way. Uh, things that we say may be mostly true or uh, we we um, we we give people the impression of, of uh, agreeing with them when when in, it isn't really our feeling uh, in that instance, and so on and so forth. Uh, part of speech, of course, is being skillful. And um, um, as monks, for instance, we are um, encouraged and, and required basically that when we give admonishment to another monk, that we do so. We, we, there are certain conditions that are that are applied. Is it a time? Is it timely? Am I free of of, of this particular fault? Uh, can I speak with a heart of loving kindness and so forth? So there are there there is enormous skill which can be can be directed uh, towards the realm of speech. And I I know that the, <laughs> this is hardly a surprise to anyone in this room. Um, speech is sort of kind of in between uh, physical action. It is a Obviously, it is a type of action, uh, vacha kama. It's a, it's a, the action of speech, but it's kind of a little bit less than physical action, overt physical action, and it's uh, making making known, making audible, kind of what's going on in our mind in some way. So it's kind of in between these things, and um, quite a precious place actually to examine the the nature of our intentions from one uh, moment to the next. It isn't just in speech, so I don't think uh, truthfulness is is um, it'll it'll come up in the next uh, parami with uh, with uh, aditanas or um, uh, making determinations. But it's it's uh, it's being truthful uh, uh, in regards to how it is we conduct ourselves in life and uh, what it is that we uh, attempt to live up to. And if we if we've as Ajahn Chah has indicated, we we know we can't do something uh, right now, and we recognize it. Then there is a, a, an honest ac um, acknowledgement of that. So truthfulness is uh, um, is a multi-dimensioned. Actually, all of these baramis are ha have various dimensions and uh, qualities um, from rather obvious and, and coarse to extraordinarily subtle and refined. 
the where are we now eighth Adit uh, the eighth uh, parami is um, aditana um, <clears throat> determination um, monks are often uh, making aditanas uh, determinations and I'll, I'll uh, bring one to your attention now some of you may have I know many of you know uh, Ajahn Achalo and um, a few years ago he I think I was I was I was in Bodh Gaya with him at the time when he finished his thousandth hour of sitting under the Bodhi tree uh, actually on the north wall of the of the Mahabodhi temple just around the corner from the Bodhi tree that's his favorite spot so he finished his thousandth hour and he likes he he's very fond of the number three so he said I'm gonna I'm gonna determine to sit for three thousand hours so I've had another couple thousand to go little did he know uh, that becomes more difficult he's found as he gets a little older it becomes more difficult and as the Mahabodhi temple becomes a little more popular with each passing year it becomes a little more difficult more more national carriers fly into Bo into Gaia airport and so more people come to the to Bodh Gaya etc etc it all becomes a little more difficult and um, and yet he stuck with it and so he just finished that actually in March of this year and I was back there with him um, for that uh, lovely event uh, you, you those of you who were here last week will have seen a couple of photographs just taken within minutes actually of him finishing and we had uh, chanted and praised all that and and uh, so that's an example uh, a very high uh, standard of, of uh, Aditana a bodhisattva's aditana to to undertake um, um, to live within in samsara until until uh, full buddhahood is realized that is that is the aditana of aditanas basically that is uh, one which when one done under circum circum when when made under certain circumstances um, uh, carries it's an aditan which carries through one life to another and um, and it takes a long 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 time to uh, to accomplish the rest of us though uh, from one day to the next um, you can think of in, in your own I mean we we speak about resolutions all the time New Year do they do New Year's resolutions in Australia I suppose so uh, that's that's a type of aditana and it's almost um, it's almost a truism that they don't often last more than three or four days into the into January. But, but nevertheless, you can ask yourself if you've ever made such an aditan, a resolution in New Year's. Um, what does it feel like when you've when you've broken it and then sort of given it up? It, it, there's a kind of lessening of of oneself, a feeling of kind of letting oneself down a bit. One of the one of the skills with with aditans with with um, determinations is to is to set them in the right kind of way. My first uh, teacher, Ajahn Sona from from Birkin Monastery, um, he uh, he was he he used aditana quite effectively. He had as a layman too. He had quite an interesting kind of career before becoming a monk. By the way, I have I don't actually know what time it is. So. <laughs> Half, sorry, thank you. Um, he said, you know, uh, think of them in three categories: easy ones that you know you can keep. Okay, um, you're a gum chewer. You're a gum chewer. You're an inveterate chewer of gum, and um, you chew two packs a day. And you make a determination: I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut it down to one pack a day, and you do it. And you know, that's uh, if unless it's um, some sort of, thank you unless it's uh, chewing gum is just uh, uh, impossible for you to imagine doing without. I mean, probably that's a doable aditan, and you bring it down to one a day, and, and you get to feel the, the, the result of having, having accomplished that, and you stick with it, and so far, so good. So s some uh, resolutions, uh, you have to recognize, you make them really easy, and just stick with it. Yeah, okay, there we go. You can make resolutions around uh, your quality of speech. Um, the next time, you know, because there's this little habit my spouse has of saying this, and I almost always respond in a way that I re later regret. Next time he or she says that I'm going to, 
I'm just going to remain quiet for, I'm going to make sure I remain quiet for five seconds, not say anything in response for five seconds. So that's a, maybe that's a middle thing. Maybe that's a, a, a you know a middle type of aditan, of, of uh, determination, and you stick with it. Sometimes you don't, and then you you bring your ba yourself back into it, and you do it again, and you do it again. So again, you get to see you get to see that uh, that interface, and and how difficult it is to keep you keep bringing yourself back and 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 uh, re restraining yourself once again and sticking with it. So. There are determinations that we keep that are um, that that we expect we can do. Maybe we're we're 60 percent, 70 percent sure we sh can keep them almost all the time. And finally, uh, sometimes it can be a value to make uh, a determination which is really hard. It's a kind of 90 percent thing, and um, you don't. Y you're not sure you could keep it f for a long, long time, but maybe for, for one day at a time or for a whole week or something like that. And um, so you, you know yourself well enough to realize what it is that you can and cannot do. But even those difficult ones, which, which you're, you know, if you're honest, you're pretty sure you'll, you'll, you won't be able to keep for too long, you, you get to test yourself. You get to put yourself in this in this worthy contest and see how strong you are and and realize where it's easy to falter, where things begin to fray at the edge, and where you you know the times, the conditions under which you really could stick with your guns. So aditanas uh, are are uh, have great deal of value applied to the spiritual life. Of course, uh, this this quality of being able to stick with something is a, of extraordinary importance. So sometimes uh, your normal sitting period is 20 minutes and just is so, so hard to, you know, continue beyond 20 minutes and you make a resolution, this time I'm sitting for 30 minutes. I'm not going to move. I'm actually going to get myself comfortable. I'm not even going to move. What's going to happen? It's not going to kill me. It's just difficult and I'm not used to it and the mind starts to feel, you know, uh, squeezed and, and, and um, heating up and that, but still I'm going to stick with it. That's the kind of thing that uh, us practitioners can do with, with, great, uh, with great value. The ninth parami is metta. And we've just uh, chanted the metta sutta in English, so maybe I'll uh, not speak about this too much since it is uh, fairly, spoken, fairly often spoken of uh, in, in, in Dhamma circles and between ourselves. But uh, kindness, loving kindness, of course, um, is something which going back to number one, is always a gift for ourselves and others. Uh, we, we make of ourselves a friend to, to beings. Um, we make of ourselves even a friend to, uh, to beings that we cannot see. There's no reason to believe that devas do not look upon us with kindness and, uh, and interest when they see people who, who, are, who are undertaking a spiritual life in the way that I'm describing here and who are exhibiting, say, this quality of, of metta to a, to a large and larger degree. The final one is upeka, equanimity. Uh, upeka should not be misunderstood for indifference, uh, passivity or kind of um, apathy. Uh, upeka rather is um, the emotional, the, the capacity to remain in a balanced, poised uh, a state of, 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 of harmony, even in the midst of difficulty or very good news or very bad news or winning or losing, that kind of thing. But the mind is not, is not thrown off track, is not, is not destabilized. We don't find ourselves uh, worried or elated by, by different forms of news or what we're watching on television, the latest uh, drama on television or what it is that our friends are telling us uh, from one day to the next. Not because we're indifferent, but uh, in fact, uh, loving kindness and compassion and sympathetic joy are available to such a, such a heart and mind. However, there is this, great, this, this stable capacity to, to, to hold and to keep. It's, it's available uh, uh, in, the, in, um, uh, in, <clears throat> in the presence of each moment. 
Upeka, uh, as you'll see from reading Buddhist literature, of course, can be expressed to a very, very profound degree in a, in a figure such as the Buddha himself. But we, we can observe it in ourselves and others too, to a, you know, a lesser degree, much lesser degree from, from one day to the next. It's perhaps the most subtle of what are called the Brahma Viharas, the, the, the divine abidings, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. It's very subtle. Perhaps it is the most um, closely aligned or resonant with wisdom itself. So those are the ten Barmis, and I'll just uh, close by saying that um, uh, we, they are all within our grasp to one degree or another. One or other of them may feel uh, uh, we, we understand it better, and perhaps uh, people that know us would say we express one or another of them uh, to, some, to some fair degree. Others, perhaps, maybe, maybe resolution, aditana, we find uh, is, is a tough one to follow. Uh, but all of them are, are developable for, for certain. And, and as I say, putting them on your fridge or something of this kind, reminding yourself of these uh, ten perfections is a very valuable um, uh, uh, supplement or a way of conceiving a spiritual life. It gives us particular goals and, and aspects, dimensions of the spiritual life that is, I think, very skillful to, to consider. So an arhat needs to uh, develop them perfectly. Uh, some of you may have chanted, you know, uh, uh, dana parami, dana upaparami. Upaparami is an, I, this is the way I've understood it at least, a pacheka Buddha, a so-called silent Buddha, a Buddha who does not teach broadly, uh, has to develop the ten paramis to a higher level, upaparami. And then, dana paramata parami so the highest form paramata parami this is what is required by a samasam buddha so um, uh, the the five buddhas that we'll have in this age the four that have occurred now and the one remaining uh, they have to they have to develop uh, the paramis to this extraordinary level i'm going to share a story but uh, it's not a personal story <laughs> um, just about uh, just about an arahant that that um, that uh, lives in Thailand at, at this time, and um, he uh, he was quite sick a number of years ago, and uh, he relayed uh, an experience that he had. He was uh, actually uh, dying, and um, there was so much pain in the body. The heart was uh, was in very very uh, bad shape due to some conflicting medications and stuff. His mind actually just just left left the body, and uh, because he had has had uh, such an affinity, and maybe over many lives, but has such an affinity with the place of Bodh Gaya, with you know the the seat of enlightenment itself, his mind went right there, and when it went there, he saw a, a great spiritual figure, basically um, from a different realm, kind of directing him away from from uh, attaining parinibbana basically but rather uh, let's you know just wait on this a second kind of thing just why why could this being do it well this being uh, apparently was a, a a great bodhisattva so this bodhisattva had probably developed a, a kind of perfection which I guess we'll call a, um, a delay, you know, the perfection of, of, of uh, wholesome delaying of, of uh, parinibbana. So um, then this, this, uh, this great monk uh, felt the presence of, um, uh, of the merit of, of, of uh, various Buddhas kind of just showering him or, or you know, uh, allowing his uh, his mind to absorb this uh, this uh, these blessings, and uh, give give it the sort of strength to be able to return to the body and continue in this life. So, um, um, yeah, I I, I uh, living in Thailand with with a lot of monks, and I expect it's uh, similar. The circumstances similar living in in Sri Lanka, to a lot of monks and monastics and people who have. Uh, 
very deep experience in, in some of these matters. Um, he, <laughs> well, it's different than living in Canada, going to a meditation class once a week, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it's different. M Melbourne is a, is a kind of interesting place, I have to say, because you, you, you get some uh, very remarkable monks coming through this city. Um, and uh, some very, very great teachers, and uh, some sort of merit is, is present here, perhaps uh, owing to the kinds of intentions and things that have occurred for decades now at the BSV. I'm sure that's part of it, and uh, perhaps for many other reasons that none of us is quite, um, is quite cognizant of, but uh, uh, I do hope and I encourage you to continue to, to make advantage of, the, uh, of these conditions because they, in the world as I see it, they are quite special. Yeah. So I'll, maybe I'll close with that for today. Thank you for your attention.